Thank you very much for that very nice introduction. Uh, I'm very excited to be here, and this venue is incredible. Uh, it was good to meet many of you today, and uh, looking forward to giving this talk. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to be talking about behavioral economics. So I do apply behavioral economics in my own research. Um, and to start with, I wanted to give a very brief history of behavioral economics. I know that many in here already have a good sense for behavioral economics, but to many of you, it may be a new field uh, that you're still trying to kind of orient and understand how it fits into the broader uh, economic discipline. Um, so, so let me begin there. Um, so, so to understand behavioral economics, you have to understand some of the history of economics itself. So, so arguably, modern day economics began in the in uh, the late 18th century with Adam Smith and others, um, and uh, at that time, this was called classical economics. is is the is the name that's referred to, um, and Adam Smith and others developed an idea of markets and that they could be in some ways self-regulating. Uh, there was a theory of value. Um, and importantly, at that time, if you read Adam Smith's primary books, you'll read that there was a lot of psychology in the way he thought about economic markets. So he would talk about things like uh, emotions, uh, self-control problems, uh, overconfidence. You would see all of this in his writings. Um, and, and you can see this also in the way that he would describe how people behave. And he would talk about people that they had two parts. They had an uh, a impartial spectator, and they had, uh, they had passions. And these passions and the impartial spectator within people were, were in conflict uh, at times. And, and so, so this is, if you're, if you're familiar with modern day behavioral economics, you'll realize that a lot of those themes can be found in, in his original work. Um, so, so classical economics continued for a while, and in about 1870, uh, several different events took place at about the same time that brought in what has been called neoclassical economics. Right? So the neoclassical economic period began in the late 1800s. And, and what happened here is there were some, some economists that were really good at math. Uh, and they came in and they said, all right, let's, let's put some, some rigor and some structure to, to this idea of economics. And so they did that by creating these models. Um, and it ends up that these passions that Adam Smith would talk about were very hard to model. Um, it, was, it was hard to model uh, emotions and self-control and things like that. It was easier to model preferences and optimization. Um, and so that end up, end, ends up being what a lot of these models were. It was based on a rational choice theory framework. Uh, and, and it was called a marginal revolution because it involved optimizing things at the margin. Um, so this took place in about 1870 and, and continued forward. And this was the neoclassical period of economics. Um, and I want to make it clear that I think this is really cool stuff. So I, I fell in love with economics when I first took an econ class at Brigham Young University. And I was sitting in there and one of the first topics we had is we were talking about these islands and Someone got stranded on an island, threw some coconuts or something. I can't even remember what it all was. Right? All of you have heard the same sort of stories. But then someone else arrives on the island. And they are really tall, so they're good at knocking down palm leaves or something. And then you start to have trade. And, and I remember the moment that I really fell in love with economics was when, 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 the, when the professor of this class talked about how the person who landed on the island, what if, what if that person was better at everything? both picking coconuts and sowing fig leaves and different things. What if they were better at everything? Would you still have trade? And the answer, of course, is yes. You only need to have a comparative advantage in order to make trade um, uh, mutually beneficial. And it, it was that moment when I thought, wow, this is something cool. This is applying to the real world. I'm in love with economics. Anyway, neoclassical economics produced an, an enormous amount of really cool stuff. Now. Um, have people heard of the Chicago School of Economics? Um, so if, if, you, if you're at the University of Chicago, you have to know a lot about this. Uh, this is an important part of neoclassical economics. So the Chicago School of Economics was a series of, of fairly influential economists who 
who started applying this rational choice theory in neoclassical economics to a broad range of topics, things like sociology, finance, law, economic history, macro, and other things. Um, it was really taking this rational choice theory and saying, hey, let's take this very seriously and, and let's start applying it kind of everywhere. And you can see where maybe this could start to go wrong. So take, for example, the application of rational choice theory to something like marriage, uh, where, you know, well, how do you decide who you get married to? Well, you're maximizing present discounted value of future life streams and finding complementarities. And, and when you tell someone normal about that, they say, whoa, whoa, whoa that's not marriage. Uh, there's other things involved with marriage, things like emotions and falling in love. Uh, you might imagine the same thing about chronic. It's not just maybe about you know, maximizing expected benefits and costs. It could be about you know, revenge and you're feeling upset or frustrated or, or mental illness or other things that could be going on with crime that wouldn't necessarily be part of this rational choice framework. Now, in fairness though, the idea behind some of what Gary Becker and others did is they said, well, how far can we push this? Can we make it can we make it fit a bunch of things? And, and it can explain a lot of decisions that people make, even things like crime and other things, right? When I'm driving down the street, I see a police officer on the side of the road, and I slow down. Well, my expected cost just went up, but well, there we go. I just followed Gary Becker's rational choice theory for the crime. Um, so it does explain some behavior, but you might just imagine it doesn't explain it all. OK, so what happened? While, while the Chicago School was very intensely applying this rational choice framework everywhere, there started to be some rumblings within the economics community that this wasn't all quite right. Um, and uh, it started with some people like Herbert Simon and Daniel Ellsberg and, and Maria Lay, who maybe you've heard uh, these names, who started coming up with some anomalies and, and paradoxes that, that were hard to explain with, with standard uh, economic models. Uh, but it really intensified in the 70s uh, with, with Richard Thaler and Danny Kahneman and Amos Tversky. Um, so these three individuals who are thought of as the fathers of behavioral economics um, started to uh, they started to say, it's more than just people kind of make silly mistakes sometimes. The number one thing that they started to talk about is that there could be systematic biases in the mistakes that people make. So not just kind of people will occasionally make a mistake, but you can actually predict when people are going to make a mistake. They're going to be predictably irrational. Uh, and that started to have an important impact on the field. Because as soon as you can predict mistakes, well, now that opens up a whole bunch of policy and interventions that you can try to do. Uh, businesses can try to make money off of people who are making systematic mistakes. Right? So you can see how this opened up a, a whole new idea of how one could think about uh, human irrationality. Um, so I don't want to spend too much time here. There's, there's lots of recent material and books and things that you can read about, um, about what happened over this kind of 30-year uh, span from the 80s through, through now, or 40 years. Um, but, but it's been kind of a, a, a big change within economics to think about these systematic biases. Um, and uh, Dick Baylor, of course, last year won the Nobel Prize for his work. And Danny Kahneman also won the Nobel Prize uh, about 15 years ago. Uh, Amos uh, has, has passed away at that time. Um, but Amos and Danny's uh, big piece was Prospect Theory, which was published in 1979. It was one of the most cited article in economics um, and has had enormous impact. But then it's been followed up with a lot of other important topics within behavioral economics. So some of the key topics that you'll, if you took a behavioral economics class, this would be what the syllabus would look like. Uh, in most classes, you talk about heuristics and biases, reference points, and loss aversion, self-control, fairness, bias beliefs, salient, behavioral finance, nudges and choice architecture is a more recent uh, idea. Uh, so this is kind of what behavioral economics has, has evolved into. Okay, now, there's been some pushback. Not everyone loved this new uh, you know, evolution of economics in a way. Um, including many of my colleagues at, at Chicago, who aren't the biggest fans of, of some of this stuff. Um, and, and some of the pushback 
has been about that a lot of the early stuff in behavioral economics was being done in the laboratory. Um, it's hard to show that people are biased. You have to kind of have just the right you know, setup or just the right experiment to show that people are making an irrational choice. Um, but it ended up that a lot of the early work was focused on kind of laboratory or even survey evidence. Uh, and for the economists in the room, they know that the economists have always kind of looked down on things that didn't have real stakes and didn't uh, you know, have experienced agents making decisions out in markets that matter. Um, and, and so, so let me give an example of a couple of quotes that, that, that describe this, uh, this criticism of behavioral economics. So Gary Becker said, one can get excellent suggestions from experiments, but economic theory is not about how people act in experiments, but how they act in markets. And those are very different things. That may be useful to get suggestions, but it is not a test of the theory. The theory is not about how people answer questions. It is a theory about how people actually choose in market situations. So you can see what he's saying there, right? Um, here's another quote from Steve Levin and John Liss. Perhaps the greatest challenge facing behavioral economics is demonstrating its applicability in the real world. In nearly every instance, the strongest empirical evidence in favor of behavioral anomalies emerges from the lab, yet there are many reasons to suspect that these laboratory findings might fail to generalize through the markets. All right, so this was, I think, in some ways a challenge to this budding field of behavioral economics to say, okay, pretty interesting stuff, but does it actually matter the markets that we care about in every stuff? Um, so I would argue that the last 15 years or so of behavioral economics has been primarily focused, in addition to expanding the field in other ways, but it's largely been focused on trying to show that it matters in markets that we care about. Okay? Um, I want to share, and, and this is what I do. Um, so, so I started as a labor economist at Berkeley and pretty soon fell in love with behavioral economics. Um, and, and my research is trying to show when does psychology matter and when does it not matter uh, in markets that we might study and care about as economists. All right? Um, so, so what I want to do today is, is share three examples. Um, uh, I wanted to choose kind of three very different things that, that might be fun to think about and look at. Uh, the first is, I'm gonna, they're all thinking about kind of how do we think about this stuff in the field and, and to think about how much it matters. So I want to start with a case study. So this is, uh, this is a case study that I teach in, in my MBA class. Um, so this is, the idea here is how does behavioral economics apply to, to management? Uh, or how does it apply to, uh, to, to a situation where a business leader might be trying to make an important decision? And then I'll give two examples from my own research, uh, both in the, in the car market, about how behavioral economics can play out in the car market. Okay? Uh, so let me start with this, this uh, idea of fairness. So, so fairness is pretty cool. This is an important talk. It has a lot of interesting kind of uh, dynamics within behavioral economics. But I want to just primarily give an example. So let's talk about the demobilization of US soldiers at the end of World War II on the European front, okay? Okay, so when World War II ended, uh, there were over seven million armed forces that were, uh, that were abroad, and they needed to be returned home in some sort of systematic fashion, but it was gonna take some time. Uh, you couldn't kind of bring everyone back at once, both for operational reasons, just, you know, boats and, and other, and ships and other things, uh, but also you didn't want to, to uh, mess up the peace effort that was going on and kind of destabilize the area. So you had to, to, to demobilize over time. So a really big question was, well, how do we decide how to bring these troops home? Uh, and in particular, in what order do they get to come home? Uh, now you might imagine that everyone wanted to come home first, right? <laughs> um, and, and so the question is, well, how do you actually do it? So let me start by letting you guys uh, think about it. So imagine you've been put, in, been put in charge of bringing the troops home. And I want you to think about how would you do it. And in fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you with your table mates for two minutes to discuss how would you decide, what would you do to bring these troops home? All right? So take two minutes and discuss with your table mates. <laughs>
got a chance to at least kind of talk a little bit. And I want to take a, just a couple of people's responses. So raise your hand if you're able to keep up with a way to bring the moment. I want you to yell it out with what you decide. Who's willing to share? Yes, please. All right, so just whoever's been there the longest, they get to come home first. You do it in reverse order. Seems reasonable. All right, other ideas? Yes, please. Those that are injured? Good. So those that are injured may, may, may uh, get to come home early. Thank you. Start the point system with some of these factors we you know, you know, have to ah, So not just one factor, but you could combine different things by having some sort of point system. I like that. I like that. Yes. Ah, okay. All right. So, so I, I've got a true Chicago school. Uh, so you could, so so you could just say, well, whoever's willing to pay the most could come home first. But it sounds like you probably thought, oh, I don't know if people would like that. What if we give everyone a huge bonus, and then how much of their bonus would they be willing to pay? That puts them all kind of on equal ground, right? Although it still is, in some ways, you could say, hey, if I have a ton of money sitting at home, right, it's kind of like I'm just, it, money is fungible, right? Uh, but good, okay, I like this. It's an interesting idea. Other, a couple more thoughts? Yes, please. Good. So certainly you want to be thinking about kind of just the tactical deployment issues, right? That you might need to worry about. Who needs to stay for, for peacekeeping reasons or other things. Good. One more. Who one more table? Someone in the back. Or right back there, yes. Just a random lottery, so everyone has a fair chance at ah, Good. One could do a random lottery. Right? There's something very fair about a lottery, right? Um, and certainly a lottery was used to some degree in the draft process as well for uh, uh, later on in, 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 very, in various U.S. conflicts. Okay, so you can see that there's lots of, lots of possible ways that one could go about this. Um, I would argue that all of these answers are, are kind of missing the boat. Um, that none of these answers are quite getting at the most important fact. All right. So, so here's what I mean by that. So, there's, there's, uh, in in the fairness literature, there's different types of fairness or different. You guys hear me fine without the mic? Or does it help with the mic? Okay. Um, in in the fairness literature, there's different types of justice that people talk about, and in particular, there's two types. One is called distributive justice. And one is called procedural justice. So distributive justice is how just do final allocations of outcomes seem? Right? Does, it just, does it feel like a, a, a fair distribution of goods? Procedural justice is how fair was the process that, that led to the distribution of goods? And one of the things, so, so here's a couple of findings that you can, you can read about and learn about in behavioral economics and, and of course, psychology, management, and conflicts, and everything, uh, conflict resolution, and other literatures as well. But a couple of findings is one is people end up caring almost more, or sometimes a lot more, about procedural justice than they do about actual distributive justice. They care about the process through which a decision was made almost as much as the decision itself. And furthermore, another thing you can find is that people don't really, people that are making decisions, often only think about distributive justice. So, so I asked this question, what would you do if you were put in charge? And immediately, your responses were drawn to distributive justice. What are the ways that I could figure out how to do this that would make, that would be fair in, in a distributive sense? But what about the procedural justice? How do you make sure that everyone is on board with this and feels like the process was fair? So let me tell you what they actually did, which I think is, is, is an incredible example of, of actually getting it right. I think this was a very well uh, uh, a job, and people can argue, and I'm not a historian, and, uh, but, but people can argue, but, but I think this was pretty good. The number one first step that they did is they surveyed and asked everyone who was going to be affected by this policy, all of the soldiers, they asked them what they thought 
should be the way to return. All right, that's I think the, the key here. Does everyone see that? Before jumping to, okay, this is how we're going to do it, let's do this, and this, and this, it's okay. Let's make sure that everyone feels like they're part of this process. They surveyed every single soul, right? That comes with it, it takes time and energy and effort to do that. But they surveyed every soldier and asked them, what do you think the most important factors are that should determine whether you come home early or not? And then they surveyed them all again the second time. They took the, import, they took the things that people said were the most important. And then they asked them to start doing trade-offs to, to determine the weights that each of those factors should have. So we're about surveyed twice now. Um, and then they came up with a point system. Um, where this, uh, the point system itself doesn't matter so much for, for what I'm trying to argue here, but, uh, but, they, but everyone got one point per month for length of service. Uh, they got one point per month additionally for a length of time overseas. They got, excuse me, five points per star or combat decoration. So for combat exposures, relates to injury and things. Uh, and then they got 12 points per child under the age of 18, up to three kids, or kids of the public. Right, so dependence, that's an interesting one. So that's one that, that a lot of the soldiers wrote in that they thought would be an important factor is whether they had kids at home. So they took this and then they, they, they put it out and they said, hey, this is a simple, we're not going to try to, uh, you know, they, they wrote down exactly what the combat declaration had to be in order to get those five points. They were very precise about how you got points. They were very strict about it. And they said, all right, this is it. This is the input that you gave us of how, how you thought it should be done. And that's what they use. And it ends up that there have been surveys that have done on this uh, after the fact, and, and most people thought it was a pretty fair system. Uh, not everyone. Some people were still frustrated by it. Um, but I would argue one of the most important parts of that is the fact that they asked people for their input. And they said, hey, here's what you guys told us you thought we should do. OK. That's kind of interesting. And, and so let me just say, uh, let me just say there's lots of applications of this type of thing. So imagine, think about yourself as a business leader. Uh, think about yourself with your clients or with your employees, maybe. Uh, let's imagine that you need to have a change of strategy or a change of price with your clients. Even. What are ways that you can get their input and help them feel like there's some procedural justice in the process? Uh, imagine you're a faculty member. We have a bunch of faculty here, and you're doing grades. How often do you think about distributed justice versus procedural justice? Right? It's easy to think about, OK, what do I think is the fair way to assign grades? A second question would be, well, how do I make sure that the students feel like they have some part in this process and that they feel like it's fair from a procedural standpoint? Does that make sense? Um, I think this applies in a lot of different situations and, um, and, and is an important thing to be thinking about with whenever we're thinking about some fair distribution of these students. Okay. Uh, that's the end of example one. Are there any burning questions about that? I know you've been told not to ask questions, but I, if you have a burning question, I'd love to hear it. Okay. Uh, all right. So there's been uh, there's been lots of other stuff done on fairness uh, in in behavioral economics. So so Richard Thaler, for example, has done a lot of stuff. So why don't stores price umbrellas uh, a little higher when it's supposed to rain? Um, well, people don't find that to be very fair, right? They get frustrated with stores that try to try, try to increase the price when there's something like a hurricane that comes through. Uh, why does why did Uber do this surge pricing? It ended up being kind of a disaster to tell. Uh, I mean, they still do it kind of behind the scenes, but but when you put it on your phone and it said you're going to be paid four times the rate today, right? Big big bold letters, right? They got rid of all of that. People don't like to hear that, right? They don't want to to see that they're paying more than they normally would pay, uh, just because it happens to be crowded out. Uh, there's lots of applications of this fairness idea in various business uh, uh, and real world, uh, real world, real markets that we care about. All right, let me move to the second, uh, the second one. I want to talk about um, the, the, uh, the used car market. So I'm going to have two examples on this. So I want to start by introducing what this market is. So the, the wholesale car auction market is a really big market in the US that a lot of people aren't very familiar with. 
what happens is, is when you take a car, let's say you take a car in and you buy a new car, but you trade in your used car. It's kind of a convenience that the new car dealership provides for you when you buy a new car. But now, let's say it's a new car dealership and they have this used car. They don't want to sell a used car in a new car dealership you got a lot. Or maybe you trade it in a Honda, but they're a Ford dealership, right? And so what do they do? Well, they take all of these trade-ins and they ship them off to these wholesale car auctions, right? So the suppliers of cars to these auctions are, are dealers that have trade-ins. And there's also some fleet lease co companies that sit there. So you know, Hertz Rental Car Company will take all of their cars and just send them to the auctions once they're done with them. Um, anyway, so those are the suppliers of cars to this market. So then they get to this market and they're auctioned off uh, with a live auctioneer. And the people who are buying in this market are, are retail car dealers. So you can't actually go to this market unless you have a dealer's license. You go to the market and you can buy a car at this wholesale market and then you take it back to your car lot and sell it to final retail customers at a market. All right? So that's how this market works. And this market is moving millions and millions of cars every year uh, in the US uh, from, from uh, you know, trade-ins and fleet lease companies all the way to, to, to retail customers. Okay. So let me show you, I'm going to be interested in this middle part of, of how do these auctions actually work and how do they do this. So I want to show you an example of an auction, okay? So he'll be from the used car company, or from, I'm sorry, from the dealership who's selling this trade-in or whatever it is. Um, so he's standing there. He doesn't really do anything during this process, except at the end of the auction, the auctioneer's gonna lean over to him, and that, uh, the owner of the car says yes or no, whether they're willing to sell at the price, the, the highest price that the auctioneer was able to obtain. All right, so the auctioneer's gonna do the auction, and then the, the dealer gets to say whether they want that deal or not, okay? And now you, it's kind of hard to understand what he's saying. Um, he started, uh, if, if you heard, he started uh, with what's called a fish price. He yelled out $26,000 uh, for this truck that's coming through uh, that they're auctioning off. Uh, so that's called a fish price. Um, it's always, they always do a fish price that's higher than the price that they think the car will eventually sell for. And then they work, they work their way down. So if you heard, he said 26,000, no one bid. Then he said 24, 23, 22, 19. So within about 10 seconds, he went from $26,000 all the way down to $19,000. And a bid came in at 19,000, and now he's working his way back up. All right, so that's where we're at. So let me keep playing it for just a little bit.
it sold for $24,700. You see it lean over to the dealer, and the dealer said, all right, I'll take that price. The car sold. That car moves out. The next car you saw was already rolling in. Um, and they do one of these auctions about every 90 seconds, and they'll have at the big, at the big auction houses, they'll have 18 or more lanes going at the same time, and they'll have cars streaming through all day long. So they'll have them all lined up, uh, and these cars will just go through, and every 90 seconds, and occasionally the auctioneers will take a break, and another auctioneer will step on, and they'll just run this just like this. Okay, so a few things. Um, first of all, this is not how economic auction theory suggests that an auction should be run. Um, uh, far from it, right? This is, this is not how Milgram wrote it up. Um, there's, there's, it's not obvious why you would even want a live auctioneer. Why not just have a cheaper process? These auctioneers get paid you know, six figures um, to, to run these auctions. Um, you know, why, why have all that cost involved? Uh, why not have a simpler process? Um, and uh, yeah, it's this is weird, right? Um, it's not clear why this is happening. So, so we, so some co-authors and I, Justin Sidner, Nicola Safer, and Brad Larson, and I, we we worked with the, the largest auto auction company here in the U.S. Uh, they they gave us access to their data. We met with them and talked with them and talked with their auctioneers, and we were interested in trying to figure out if these auctioneers now. Uh, they're in a bit of a state of trying to wonder kind of what they should be doing as well with you know modern technology and everything. There's a lot of different ways that one could run these. They were also wanting to try to figure out how to pay these auctioneers um, and, and wanted a better objective measure of who was performing well. Um, so, so what we did is we took the data and it ends up, so, so you don't have to know a lot of statistics or anything to understand how this would work. But because the auctioneers are kind of moving around a lot, you get auctioneers that take another spot, and they get kind of somewhat randomly assigned to different lanes, you can control for things and do a pretty good job of determining, you can do a pretty good job of getting situations where an auctioneer has, is getting kind of random cars. So someone, you get a bunch of different auctioneers that are seeing a randomly similar mix of cars, and then you can just see which ones do better. Now, the, the measure that the auction house cares about the most, and the auctioneers say this is the measure they care about, is selling a car. They're not necessarily working for the buyers or the sellers of this company. They just want to create matches. And they actually get paid based on matches that are created. And so their job is just to try to create matches. Um, and, and so we, that's the main outcome that we look at, is which auctioneers are able to get a higher conversion rate of their cars. And it ends up that the good auctioneers, once you control, you have to control for some basic shrinkage stuff to make sure you're not just getting outlier effects and other things. But, but once you do the proper controlling, the, the good auctioneer, say that the 90th percentile auctioneer, is selling about five percentage points more cars uh, than the 10th the, the percentile auctioneers. Right? So you calculate out how much that is worth to the auction house, and the answer is yeah, they should be paying what they're paying, especially these good auctioneers. Um, and so we let me get back to my slides. So, so we, we did a bunch of things where uh, we not only showed that their conversion rates were significantly different, uh, but it ends up that they did other things differently. The good auctioneers, not only did they get higher conversion rates, but they were also running their auctions much faster. So it's not like they were just like taking more time, and they were actually running their auctions a lot faster, about 10 seconds faster off a base rate of about 90 seconds. So they were doing the auctions faster, and getting higher prices, and having higher conversion rates. Uh, we found that the, the good auctioneers, they were consistently the good ones over time, that you know, when you split the data across years and things, you find similar things. And one of the great things is before we looked at our results, uh, and before we showed the results to the auction house, we had them uh, rank their auctioneers based on who they thought was best. And then we could correlate our more kind of objective rankings, data-driven rankings, with their subjective rankings, and it ends up that the correlation was very high. So they actually had a really good sense of who their auctioneers, good auctioneers were, and not that problem all the time. Occasionally we said, hey, this auctioneer is incredibly good, and they didn't think they were so hot. Uh, but the correlation was quite high between our rankings and theirs. Um, so, 
So, so what is it that makes a good auctioneer? Well, our paper mostly just showed that auctioneers differ in ability. It's a little harder to say exactly what it is. We did a lot of surveys of the, of the auctioneers themselves and things. I'll, I'll tell you, although it's a little bit hard to kind of prove this mathematically or something, I'll tell you what we think is our best guess of what makes a good auctioneer. So all the auctioneers say the following. They say, what you've got to do is you've got to set a good fish price. And if you've, if you've taken a site class, think about anchoring or something, kind of getting people to think about high prices. Set a good fish price, but then come down quick, because you won't want to get people kind of lollygagging around. You come down quick, a bid comes in, and then they said, here's the trick. You've got to move the price up as fast as you can without an auction ever stalling out. So you, you choose your increments such that you, you're pretty sure a bid will come in quick. Because they said, if you try to do a too big of increment and it kind of stalls out, they said, the, the auction's over. They said, they'll never get people back on board. You have to like build that momentum and keep it going. Uh, so, you, so you move up in increments, so you have to go fast. That explains why their auctions are faster. Right? The good auctioneers are doing it very quickly and they get kind of people, they get them on board and they start going up and up and up and up and they kind of get them before people kind of slow down to think about it too much. So that's our best explanation of, of what makes these good auctioneers. Uh, and we can argue and show how, how valuable we think these good auctioneers are relative to others. Comments or questions on that? Yes, please. Yeah, so we've started, we've got access to video of these auctioneers, and we've started to go through a process of trying to code up some of the stuff. So we can code up the fish price, and we can code up other things, just like we, we've done some, some voice analysis. Uh, because some of the auctioneers also say that, well, you've got to have a really good voice, too. Um, so we've done a few things like that. We haven't made a lot of headway, but that is a direction that I think you could go. Uh, you could also go to the laboratory again. I think there's some... Uh, you know, I've been talking about behavioral economics in the real world, but certainly you could then, what about running an experiment where, where you have a clock that's going, for example, and you make people bid at faster increments or something, um, and see if that matters. So you could test some of these hypotheses in an experimental setting that's very clean and easy to understand. Uh, good, other comments or questions on this? Yes, please. Yeah, good question. So they're not supposed to. It's not written down or anything. The, the dealer usually just kind of has it in their head. It's not even clear they have it in their head <laughs> uh, until they kind of get all the way done with it. Um, so yeah, usually they don't have it. Good. Yeah, so, so part of it is knowing, having a good sense for what it might sell for uh, in order to kind of set a good fish price and know the increments that you should raise. Now, when, when the car comes up, um, the, the people buying the cars have a, have a sheet that tell you the order that all the cars are going to go through so you can show up for the auction that you want to bid for and things. And on that sheet and up on the big screen, it has the make, the model of the car, the number of miles on the car. It also has um, basically like a blue book value. Um, and so even if you're a completely novice auctioneer, you can just take whatever the blue book value is, which is a pretty good estimate of Mannheim sale. Mannheim creates this number based on past historical data for, for Mannheim. I'm sorry, for this auto auction company. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a large auto auction company. Um, uh, so they create this value, and, uh, and so a, an auctioneer, even if they didn't know anything about cars, could just take that value and say add 20% or something. But it's really, they argue it's about more reading the crowd and how much interest there is on any given day to know how much you should be raising. Uh, but yeah, it takes a lot of skill and knowledge and, and certainly they can improve. They go to, they go to auctioneering school. Uh, there's an auctioneering college that they go to and take classes and things. Um, we've read some of their textbooks. It's really cool. Uh, good. Any other questions on that? Yes, please.
so that they got assigned cars that of cars that are more likely to sell. Yeah, it's a great question. So that's what most of the paper is about, actually, is trying to make sure we're identifying this cleanly. And so the way that one can do that, first of all, you can control for, for example, this, these blue book values. You can do just a control approach where you control for a ton of stuff. Um, but better is we can do things like shift changes, where you're seeing kind of a steady stream of cars. We even can control for, we know which company is selling the car. So let's say that Hertz is selling a ton of their cars that day. We see a shift change from a 90th percentile auction year to a 10th percentile auction year, and we can see their productivity jump even though they're selling a stream of cars. There's no observable difference in cars uh, at that change. Does that make sense? Um, but yeah, we have a few different methods that we use to try to get around that because that's, that's kind of a primary concern. And you can show, well, you, when their subjective rankings about auctioneers are off, one could imagine that the reason why they're off is because they didn't correct properly for the type of cars that some auctioneers were seeing. They were using the raw base rates rather than these kind of more carefully constructed rates. Uh, and, and so that's kind of the value of this more objective approach. Fantastic. All right, so let me, let me move to this last example. Um, so, so my last example is about left digit buyers. All right, so this is a bias that I think we can all relate to to some degree. Uh, it's the idea that we look at digits further to the left when we see a number, which kind of makes sense. It's a good heuristic to have. The leftmost digit tells us a lot about the number. Um, so for example, if you're looking at those first two numbers, they can seem kind of close together to people, whereas the last two numbers, they can seem kind of far apart, even though they're actually closer together. But it's because that leftmost digit has changed. Um, and, and this has been talked about in marketing a lot, this 99 cent pricing idea of why you go to a store and everything's priced at $2.99 rather than $3, because people are looking at that leftmost digit. So, uh, so uh, Justin Sidner, Nicola Sather, and I, we wanted to look and see if there was left digit bias in this used car market. And you might already be thinking of what we wanted to look at, but we were thinking that the odometer value of a car is an important metric that people use when they make their decision. Um, and we wanted to see if when a car crosses, say, a 10,000 mile threshold in their odometer reading, if that car would seem kind of very different to people because now the leftmost digit of their odometer reading changed. Does that make sense? So imagine the following graph. So I have, I'm not showing you the data yet, but, but imagine the following graph. What if I just took, so we have about 22 million used car sales in our data set. And I'm gonna show you just the raw data for these cars. So on the horizontal axis, sorry, it's cut off just a little bit. On the horizontal axis, it's the mileage of the car. And on the vertical axis, I'm gonna plot just the average sales price of the cars. And I'm gonna do it in 500 mile bins. So the first dot I'm gonna show you is cars between, say, 1,000 and 1,500 miles. Then the next one is 1,500 and 2,000, 2,000 and 2,500, 2,500 and 3,000. And I'm gonna show you the average sales price for those cars of different odometer readings. Does that make sense? All right, so what should it look like if, if neoclassical economics wins? Yeah, maybe a straight line, or I mean, it could decay a little bit, right? You could have some, maybe a nonlinear function. But capital should decay as it gets older. Um, and so yeah, it should be downward sloping, right? Uh, as cars get older, they should sell for less, one would think. Um, now, what if there's a lot of this left digit bias? Then what might you see? Yeah, you could probably draw out what you might think. What do you think? Yeah, so it might look kind of like a stair step. So it's a, a, a flat price between zero and 10,000, and then 10 and 20,000, 20 and 30. Right? So it might just kind of step down. Do people like that? Would that be your prediction? Yeah, yeah it could be if, you're, if everyone has perfect left digit bias. But what if maybe some people are paying attention, or you pay a little bit of attention to the second digit? Then it might kind of go down within one of those stair steps. But then when it hits the 10,000 mile mark, then you get kind of a drop. And then it kind of goes down, but it's still downward sloping within the 10,000 miles a little bit. Does that make sense? Anyway, that's, that's what you might expect if people pay less attention to the second most digit, but they don't completely ignore it, or some people don't completely ignore it. So let me show you what this raw data looks like. So here it is. So it's downward, downward sloping, so good, neoclassical economics, 
predicted well uh, to some degree. Um, but you do start to see these discontinuities occurring in almost all of these 10,000 mile marks. Do you see that? The black lines are where the 10,000 mile marks are. Now you don't see them everywhere. So for example, look at the 30,000 mile mark. There you get kind of some weird stuff going on and there's not really a discontinuity. Um, but it looks pretty good. Now this is the raw data. So the next thing that we do is we control for all of the observable characteristics that we have uh, on these cars. We know a lot about them. We know their model, the make, their year, the auction they were sold at, what year they were sold and everything. And when you do that, let me now show you the same plot, though, with controls. And so here it is with controls. And basically, if you notice, it kind of just cleans it up a little bit. So what was happening, for example, if you look at that 30,000 mile mark, now you are seeing a discontinuity there. Um, what was going on there is there were a bunch of lease cars that were coming in, th three or 30,000 mile lease cars that were coming in right before the 30,000 mile mark and they were kind of messing up the types of cars around that discontinuity. And once you control for the types of cars, it kind of cleans that up and you start seeing this left digit bias effect again. But that's pretty cool, right? This is my favorite graph I've ever made. Um, I love this graph. So let me, if you're not convinced, let me show you a couple more cool things about this graph. Um, I love, it's a pretty big effect at 100,000 miles, which you might imagine is right. But you actually see it start to dip a little bit, the two dots before that, right? So the 99,000 to 99,500, and the 99,500 to 100,000 mile cars, they start to drop off in value. It's as if people are like, whoa, you can't fool me, 99. Right, so you should really sell your car when it's, it's 98,900 miles or something, right? It's the time it's most uh, different from its true value function from. But that's kind of, let me show you one other cool thing about this graph. If you look closely, uh, I'm not sure if everyone can see this well, but the dots are kind of moving in pairs. Uh, so you see that, so look like at that 70,000 mile mark, you see that there's two dots, and then two, 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 two. Look at, let's say, the 50,000 mile mark, there's two, 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 two. They're kind of moving in these pairs. Can anyone explain what's going on there? That's exactly right, yeah. So, so these are small discontinuities that are occurring at every 1,000 mile mark. So this is now a third digit inattention that's happening. Um, so you can see that, so when you hit a 10,000 mile mark, you get a drop, but each of these dots is a 500 mile bin. And so within the next two dots, you're in the same, say, 50 to 51,000 range, and then you hit 51,000, and the next two dots up here, and then the next two, and we have enough data, right, with, with millions of observations, you can collapse all of this and show um, the one thing, if you kind of stack all the data together, you can see that there's these very clean drops in value of about 20 to $25 discontinuously as when a car just crosses over a, a 1,000 mile threshold. And they drop about $200 when they cross over a 10,000 mile threshold. Right, so this, what I love about this is it says, the way that we should be processing numbers in our heads is that it should be some continuous function, right? There's nothing that says this shouldn't be kind of a continuous function. And yet the way we actually process numbers is we, when we hit a left digit change, we see kind of a big change in the way we think about that number. And then when that second digit changes, there's also a little change in how we think about that number. And in fact, we can even, if we blow up the data and stack it all, you can even look at the third digit and see that within a 100 mile range, there's a little bit of paying attention there and you can get a little drop in value. Um, so this is kind of a, a cognitive model of how people process numbers as opposed to just how people should process numbers. Um, and you can do other things with this. So for example, um, uh, you can, you can show that this is robust to a lot of different things. You can talk about warranties or odometer tampering. There might be other things that you might be worried about or thinking about, and we can do a lot of work on, on those things, and it seems pretty clear to us that it's more of a kind of a psychological processing story. Uh, we have data from Canada, and there you don't see discontinuities at 10,000 mile marks, but you see them at all the 10,000 kilometer marks, right? which is kind of a fun, kind of a fun test. 
uh, as well. Um, let me show you one last thing with this project, and then and then we'll we'll wrap up, and, and I'll take any questions that people have. Um, all of this that I've been showing you is in the wholesale market, right? You might say, I don't know, this is I don't know this. This auction wholesale market seems kind of weird. Um, I'd love to see this in the retail bid too. And in fact, you might imagine if if these if in the wholesale market people are are willing to pay. So so these are these are experienced agents, right? These are actual players in this market who are paying more for a car just in front of the discount than just after. So either they're biased and they have this left digit bias. But it could be that they're just playing to the biases of their final consumers, right? If their final retail customers have this bias, then this could be a very smart way to buy cars in the wholesale market to then go sell them to their final retail customers. Does that make sense? But, but in, order, in order for that story to be even plausible, you would want to see discontinuities in the retail data as well. So let me show you the retail data. So we teamed up with, um, with Megan Bussey and Jorge Silva uh, Ariso uh, who had data, they have data for about 16 million used car sales in the retail market. So it's a 20% sample of used car dealerships. Um, and let me show you how the data there compared to our wholesale data. So here's the wholesale data that I already showed you. I'm going back to just the raw data. Again. There's, all I'm doing is plotting averages of, of these buckets. So here's the raw data in the wholesale market. And now on top of this, I'm going to put the retail data. Now, as you imagine, they're going to have a price, uh, a markup in the retail market. This is how they make money. And so you see that. So they're pricing up cars by, you know, uh, you know two to $5,000 above what they paid for in the wholesale market. But you can see that there are these strong discontinuities in the retail data, just like in the wholesale data. In fact, they're even larger in the retail data, suggesting it could be very reasonable for these dealers to be paying additional money for the cars right before the thresholds in order to make that money off of the retail customers that have this bias. Um, all right, uh, this left digit bias ends up being pretty powerful. Um, Co-authors and I have looked at this in a variety of different markets, um, and, and you see it in a lot of markets. Um, so take, for example, uh, the diamond market. Um, you might imagine that a 0.99 karat diamond doesn't sell as well as a one karat diamond, and you'd be right. Um, except the one thing you might not realize is that it's, it's almost impossible to find a 0.99 karat diamond. Um, so, so we scrape data for hundreds of thousands of loose diamonds that are being sold online, and there are tens of thousands of 1 karat diamonds and 1.01 karat. These are all gemology lab tested, so they have exact weights. There's, there's tens of thousands of 1.01 and 1.02 karat diamonds and 1 karat diamonds, and there's like 7.99 karat diamonds. Uh, so what's going on there? It's not the way they come out of the ground, right? It's the, the diamond cutters understand that their final retail customers would prefer a 1 karat diamond to a 0.99 karat diamond. And so they cut the diamonds to make sure that that's the case, right? They, it, might be, it might make a better diamond if they could, you know, shave off a little edge or something, but they're like, oh, no, that'll take it under 1 karat, so let's make sure we keep it above that. Uh, so you can see it there. But what I love about a bias like this is, is some, some people, including uh, some of my colleagues, will sometimes argue that, well, as soon as you take these biases to markets, they'll all disappear. And they could be right in some situations, right? Markets might fix some biases. But in other cases, markets don't, right? If a retail customer has a bias, it might kind of ripple through the entire market. It affects wholesale markets and prices. It affects supply chain decisions like cutting diamonds, right? Biases of final retail customers can have an impact on the whole on the whole uh, of the market, um, rather than the market kind of solving that problem in some ways. Uh, all right, let me go ahead and conclude, and then I'll take questions. Uh, let me just conclude with: I think behavioral economics is still very young. Uh, but I'm very excited about it. I'm also very biased. Uh, but, but I think as behavioral economics continues to explore applications to real-world phenomena that people, and, that people care about and, and agree matter, you know, I think behavioral economists should also continue to explore in the lab to come up with new ideas and then they then test those ideas in real-world uh, scenarios. But I think as behavioral economics continues to do that, 
Behavioral economics is going to become more and more just part of economics, right? Economists are going to start thinking about passions again. It's not just going to be the impartial spectator, but we're going to have multifaceted human beings who are all participating in these markets that economists care about. All right, thank you very much.